Alhamdulillah, you hear this often, children, you know, but I'll translate for you, inshallah. In Alhamdulillah means all praise and thanks is due to Allah. Whether we praise Him or not, the thanks is due to Him. And, and we say, Nahmaduhu, meaning we praise Him. We praise Allah. I, I praise Him. And we ask for His help. And we ask for His, I ask for His forgiveness. And I believe in him. And that belief should lead into the next statement, which is that I put my trust in him because of that belief. And I and I seek refuge in Allah from all the evil that's within myself. And I seek refuge in Allah from the evil effects of my bad deeds. You know, when I do something bad, it has some repercussions. So I seek refuge in Allah from the evil effects of my bad deeds. And then we say, uh, whoever Allah guides, nobody can misguide him. And whoever Allah lets go astray, there's no one who can guide him. And I bear witness that Allah is one and alone, and he has no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his messenger and his servant. 
respected uh, scholars, honorable elders, dear brothers and sisters, and the beloved children of Tarbiya. I know many of you are not here today because you have the school off. So Alhamdulillah, those of you who are here, it's a pleasure to be here with you. As always, Tarbiya is very close to my heart because my son also studies here. So I always think about you guys. Alhamdulillah. The subject of today's khutbah is the importance of being concerned about others. It's a topic that you can, if, you, if we read the seerah of Rasulullah we see it again and again express itself. And Rasulullah was so concerned for each and every people he interacted with that it manifested in the way he acted in those situations. So today we'll look at some of those examples and try to contemporize them for our current situation and from the stories of some of the other righteous people how they were expressing their concern for others. And more importantly, we want to understand why. Why is it important? Why is it so important to be concerned about others? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah number 3, Ayah number 110, after I've recited, you are the best community that has been raised up for mankind. Because why? Because you enjoin that which is good and you forbid that which is evil and you believe in Allah. Notice Allah didn't say you are the best of the community because certainly there are people better than us. But we are the best for the community and because we join that is we enjoy that is good and we forbid that is evil and we believe in Allah, which is the most important thing. And that belief in Allah should lead into actions that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, let's say you are working for a corporation and the corporation sets certain compliance rules. So if you have to do your business, you have to follow those compliance rules. That shows you believe in the statutory limitations that has been set in that corporation. The same thing for like children. Studying in Tarbiya school, you believe that you have a principle. But that belief should lead into actions that are pleasing to that principle. So same thing, we believe in Allah, but that belief has to lead to actions. And that action is much more profound when you are concerned about others. How can we enjoy good and forbid evil if we're not concerned about the other person? So, and doesn't have to be just Muslims, it includes non-Muslims and Muslims in general, mankind, and even to the animals and the nature. So if you look at one of the stories from Prophet Muhammad uh, the story of a man, a Bedouin, who interrupted the khutbah. Imagine a day like this, a beautiful Friday, Prophet Muhammad is in the middle of the khutbah and all of a sudden a Bedouin comes in. And a Bedouin is a man who is from the desert, he's not familiar with the cultures and the norms of the city and he comes and he starts asking Rasulullah in the middle of the speech, standing up and asking questions about the religion. The hadith is very detailed but I'm going to only focus on the aspect of how Rasulullah responded. The typical reaction for me or for anyone nowadays would have been, you know, please have a seat, we'll talk to you later, you know, this is a khutbah, you know, <laughs> this is it. But Rasulullah he was the most uh, amazing person when it comes to taking into consideration the situation. He noticed that this Bedouin, the, the tone of his voice, the body language was such that he was in a sense of desperation. And he knew that this man, if he didn't get his answer right now, he would probably never again come back to this masjid. He will never want to know about religion. And he would have just left, and he would have just not come back. So Rasulullah out of his wisdom, he asked somebody to bring a chair, and he sat down, he made sure the person understood or got what he wanted, and then he went back to the member and continued his speech. The khutbah. So what we can learn from that is that in life, in general, we are going to face situations like that. Imagine you are at work and uh, you have a colleague you are, who is reporting to you, you have a meeting coming up in 10 minutes time and all of a sudden they bring up an issue. And you are really busy, you have to finish your job and you got to be on the meeting on time and you don't have time for this uh, un unforeseen event to take place. But what should be the reaction? So 
taking into consideration, you can call it emotional intelligence, but I like to think of it being concerned for the other person. So one reaction could be that you're just busy typing and just say, yeah, what's up, how can I help you? Uh, come back to me five minutes later. Or the other reaction could be, no, I'm, I'm about to finish this thing, just give me two minutes, I'll be right with you. And then you turn to that person and you look at him or her and ask them the situation and ask them to briefly describe it to you because you, you have a deadline, you have another meeting coming, and let them know I'll come back to you. So because that shows that you are concerned about them. Because that person could have been going through a really important issue and because of not showing any concern for them, you may actually make the situation worse. Same thing can be applied to our family life. Imagine when we come back from work, you're tired, uh, and uh, your son comes to you, Abuji, I want to show you my painting. Uh, so I'm really tired. That could be one response, and say, I don't have time for you, please, I'm really tired, I just want to re relax. But we have, we have to take into consideration the emotion. So let your child know that, inshallah, I will look into it. Just give me five, ten minutes to freshen up, and inshallah, I will come and see you in five, ten minutes' time. So you take that into consideration. Let's take a look at another story. Uh, the story of Imam Abu Hanifa, uh, rahimullah. as you all know, he is a very famous Imam. And everybody, will not, uh, everybody knows that he was also interested in creating, uh, in, in, in joining that which is good and forbidding that is evil. But look at the artistry of those who try to master the art of communication. He had a neighbor who used to drink, and his neighbor was a Muslim. But the neighbor, after finishing his business, he would come back home at night and he would get drunk. And there are times he would, every night almost, he would recite a poetry. And there are times were so blessed that even the poetry was not vulgar. It was something like, you abandoned me, you don't know who I am, and all, along these lines. Now imagine you're Imam Abu Hanifa. You've had a really busy day. You've been with students, giving lectures in halakha, and you got up in the middle of the night, you made your wudu, and you want to have a special moment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you're starting your qiyamul layl. And all of a sudden you can hear the guy next door, you abandoned me, you don't know who I am. And this goes on. And maybe the first night you take it, you're being patient. Second night it goes on, you're being patient. But this goes on day after day after day. Not a single time he went up to the neighbor the next day, banged on his door and said, do you know the rulings of drinking in Islam? Do you know what Allah will do to you? All these things he could have done. None of it. None of it he engaged in because the man was doing it in the privacy of his home. But does that mean he didn't want to enjoin that which is good and forbid what is evil? Let's see. So one day, his neighbor didn't recite his poetry. So Imam Abu Hanifa got concerned. The next day, he asked his students about his neighbor if everything was okay. And they informed him that the police had passed by in front of his house. They found some weird noise. They broke into his house. They saw he was drunk. And they arrested him. So he got very concerned. And so Imam Abu Hanifa takes his mule and he starts heading towards the palace, the, where the governor is. Now, just to give you a visual idea, in Iraq at that time, the center of the city is the mosque. It's a gigantic mosque. Right next to it is a huge palace. It's surrounded by layers and layers of guards. So Imam Abu Hanifa is coming in his mule and is approaching the palace. So the guards know to see him, and he's a very famous scholar. They love him very much, even though they didn't like that he didn't take the position uh, that they had given him as a judge, but they still respected him. So he approaches the palace. The guards notify the governor and says, Oh, governor, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa is coming. What should we do? He said, don't stop his mule, just let it come all the way inside the courtyard. So he comes in, and he gently asks, uh, he says, Assalamu alaikum uh, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and they exchange the salam, and the governor asks him, oh, Shaykh al-Iraq, what can we do for you? He said, I have a request. He said, what is it? He said, your man yesterday broke into my neighbor's house, in the privacy of his home, and they arrested him. I would like you to kindly release him to me. <coughs> he said, Shaykh, for you, we're not only going to release him, but we're going to release everyone that was arrested last night for you. And so he takes his neighbor and he starts to ride back his camel, uh, to his mule towards his home. And while he's riding back, he turns gently to his neighbor and he says, I hope I didn't abandon you. Imagine the poetry the guy used to recite every night. 
And I can't do justice to Arabic the way he described it. The man was in a shockwave because he realized all this time this Imam knew what I was doing in my home and not once did he come and barge into my, my life like that. But he waited for the right time. And so the man made his tefar to Allah and he changed and he became a very good man since then. So what, goes to, what we learn from these lessons is that we too are engaged and we want to create change in people's life in positive, but we want to do it in the right way, the right conditions and the right manners. And sometimes we may rush to give feedback to someone, but if we don't know the art of giving feedback, we may end up doing more damage than we may do any, any, any good. وَأَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ وَعَلَكُمْ وَلِسَائِلِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Don't get intimidated by the number of papers I have here. It's actually a very short speech and less organized. I took a class on how to give public speaking, and they say sometimes as soon as the speaker comes in with 30 pages, some of them just, just lose it right there. <laughs> They're thinking it's going to be a long good one. But don't worry, it's a short one. It's just I just have them folded in different ways. So the next, this part of the book that we're going to focus on, how to get better in being concerned for others. Number one, set a pure intention. An intention that is for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like Prophet had said, Inna Verily, every action will be judged by the intention. So if I'm doing it for the pleasure of Allah, then I have to do it in a way that's pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, the ends do not justify the means. There's a concept in Islam that says, the ends that do not justify the means. What does that mean? Meaning that, if I want to do something good, I have to do it in a good way. If I want to bring about change that is good, I either need to, first of all, I need to look at, if I'm going to try to change something, if it's going to make it worse than it is, then I should not get involved in that. But if I'm going to make any change that may actually be better, but I've got to make sure I do it the right way. Bottom line, for some of you who have seen uh, Robin Hood, is a character that is used in the Western world a lot. He's a very nice you know, guy, he steals from the rich and he gives to the poor. But in Islam he's a thief. No matter how nice he may be, he's stealing. You can't expect to do something good by doing something bad. So if I want to give nasiha, I want to give advice to a fellow brother or a fellow uh, human being, i got to do it the right way. I can't rush into it, I can't do it in a horrible manner. Number three, Think about the person's emotion. Think about the person that you're about to have the conversation. Take into consideration their thoughts and their feelings. Uh, because if we don't take that in consideration, the timing may be not right. <coughs> Maybe the person is very busy. The, and sometimes you may, we may want to give him advice in front of public, and that may not be the best way. It should be in private, and, and so on and so forth. So taking into consideration the person's emotion is very important. Point number four, Remember death much. The reason I say this, because sometimes when we're engaged in giving nasiha or advice, we will use words that will just burn relations right away. We're very, very uh, sometimes not careful about it. And I'm going to generalize, but sometimes that happens. We, when we get angry, we, we don't pay attention to the choice of words. But if we remember death much, then it will help us in being mindful of those conversations. If I were to die tonight, if I have an argument with my fellow brother and I ended in a really bad way where I was really harsh with him, would it benefit me in my grave that he's praying against me or is it benefit me if he is praying for me? You know, in, speaking of Imam Abu Hanifa, he in his early life used to be a scholar that used to debate a lot. And he was very, very intelligent man. He could articulate his points very clearly. But later on, he changed the methodology. He didn't like it. But some of his students continued to do the debating uh, art. So he told them, don't do it. So they said, you know, you used to do it. Why, don't you, why do you discourage us to do it? He said, you know, when we used to argue or debate with someone, we were worried that they may say something that may cause them cause, to cause kufr. We didn't want to 
make them or say those words that might force him to say something that may become like a kufr with Allah. But when you guys, like us, you're talking about us, when we sometimes have arguments, we're waiting for the guy to make a mistake like that. Sometimes our arguments are so heated that we want them to fall into those traps. So remembering death helps because then we're thinking about if today is my last day, does this small matter really matter? Does this choice of words help me in my grave tonight? If it does, then it may be worthwhile. But if it's not, then we need to reassess the, the conversation. Some of the practical steps uh, that I thought about is, uh, number one, treatment of our family and our loved ones, our children. Uh, they deserve our attention, they deserve our emotional intelligence. When we deal with them, we need to take into consideration their mind, their feelings. Like the example I said earlier, oftentimes we're guilty, we're tired, we come back home, they want to spend some time with us, but we tend to turn them off. But we should take into consideration their emotion, maybe they waited for me all day, and they're you know, anxiously waiting to spend some time, so take that consideration, uh, the emotion into consideration. Number two, dealing with fellow Muslims, whether it's in a Muslim uh, community setting or in a masjid setting, be mindful of choosing the words carefully and the setting and, and giving feedback and take into consideration the other person's emotion and it will benefit a lot. And fourthly, dealing with our neighbors and colleagues. Sometimes we may want to do something good, but if we got to make sure we do it in the right way, in the right context, uh, so that it brings more uh, benefit. Just to summarize, the Khutbah's topic was the importance of being concerned for others. We gave examples from the life of Prophet ﷺ. Each time he dealt with people, he dealt with that particular person's emotion. He took into consideration that what this person's mindset is, what kind of background he's coming from, and then he adjusted his speech, his body language, everything accordingly. We talked about the, some of the scholars of the past, that they were also busy in creating chain, turning points in people's life, but they didn't rush into it. They used their hikmah, they used their uh, intelligence and uh, etiquettes of dialogue in making those changes. And uh, lastly, I want to remind everyone that there's a beautiful uh, 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 event that's going to take place next Saturday, which is November uh, 22nd. It's an event we're having uh, as a fundraising event for the school, but we have a very good speaker who's coming, uh, Brother Fahad Taslim. He is, uh, among many of his qualities, uh, he's also the head of IERA. It's an organization that's based in UK that is involved in Dawa. They do a lot of good Dawa work, and he's in charge of the North America region. So it's a great benefit to have him to come to this community, share his thoughts, and give us some of the ideas. And I think you will benefit greatly uh, from his visit, uh, inshallah. And I encourage you to please come and attend uh, that event. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our shortcomings. And we ask Allah to grant us a gracious forgiveness that leaves no sins behind. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us Jannatul Firdos and to all of our Muslim relatives who have passed away and for our children as well and for them, their offspring. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant His blessings and mercy upon all the Muslims all around the world who are suffering and in hardship and grant them relief from their hardship. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our best day our last day, our best deed our last deed. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send His blessings and mercy upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon his family, his companions, and upon all the righteous people that has passed away and will continue to pass away until the Yawmul Qiyamah. Wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah wa akhidana wa alhamdulillah 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 wa al